welcome to Chat Chat presented by the Journal of Athletic Training, the official journal of the National Athletic Trainers Association. I'm Dr. Kara Radzak, an associate professor at the School of Integrated Health Sciences in the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and your host for today. Today, I have the pleasure of being joined by Dr. Daniel Lawrence. He's the lead author of the current Con- clinical concepts article on blood flow restriction training. Dr. Lawrence is an athletic trainer and physical therapist and the director of the sports medicine of sports medicine at Lawrence Memorial Hospital in Ortho, Kansas in Lawrence, Kansas. Dan, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for the invitation. I look forward to chatting with you and I appreciate being here. So I think this is going to be a topic that has a lot of interest. How did you personally get interested in using and starting blood flow restriction training? You know, it really came from the strength conditioning literature, to be honest with you. It was, uh, I didn't really know a ton about it in rehab. Uh, uh, You know, I didn't hear about it in PT school or as coming up as an athletic trainer either. I was an athletic trainer first and nobody ever talked about it, but it was in kind of bodybuilding, not that I'm a bodybuilder, but it was in strength conditioning literature through NSCA publications and things. I started reading about it a little bit more. And then dug a little deeper. I'm like, wow, there's a lot of research that goes a ways back on this. But, you know, at the time I was coming up, there wasn't a lot of market products to even really do this other than like, you know, wrapping yourself with uh, rubber bands or belts. It just didn't seem to be a good idea to me. Uh, but really then uh, when we started to see, um, you know, in, in the, the 2010s, we started to see some athletes using it or support some stuff uh, online about that and on, on ESPN and things like that. It really kind of became uh, on the mainstream. Um, I mentioned it at a talk in 2015. Part of my talk that I did at this meeting was just on cutting edge things in sports medicine and, and uh, some trends that people uh, were, were getting into. And, you know, I was talking about suspension bands, what we know about those. I was talking about um, vibration platforms, the literature there. And then I mentioned, hey, maybe this is something we should look at mm-hmm. uh, for rehab. Uh, and I was only spent three slides on it, kind of what it does. Maybe we should look at this. And then lo and behold, a few years later, it really starts to explode. So I'm not saying that's the reason. I'm just saying that's kind of how it's evolved for me over the last uh, probably, well, started using it uh, probably seven, eight years ago, but uh, uh, learning more about it uh, preceded that. So what knowledge areas do we actually have that are well supported with available literature? What do we know about BFR? You know, it, we have a lot of really good data that goes back to prior to 2000 on, on uh, the benefits of using this in various populations. And even a distant cousin of BFR, which is ischemic preconditioning, goes back before that. Uh, mm-hmm. But the thing is, is that it was used at the IPC anyway, it was used in cardiac populations. You know, it's not a population a lot of us uh, seeing in sports medicine. So maybe that's why we, we've lost over for a long time. That being said, I think we have a, a there's a pretty good uh, volume of literature now to show that uh, low load uh, training with blood flow restriction uh, is is a great option for those who are inappropriate for traditional higher load training to gain hypertrophy and strength. Um, now, whether or not that changes performance or function is definitely a worth debating, uh, but I think we have a, a really good I- idea about that. There's some good um, research as well, that it helps with pain relief. Then I really would say the other thing too, is that we have some good literature that it helps enhance aerobic capacity. Uh, you know, I'm a simple guy and, and I think there's an ex- expression, you need to be able, if you can explain it to a six-year-old, that's what you need to be able to do. And, and I really think that the aerobic capacity piece and probably to a degree with the strength and or hypertrophy piece is that we are basically teaching the body to do more with less. And I think that's the, the main aspect there. What are areas that we kind of need a little bit more research to evaluate some areas that are really understudied? Oh man, there's, there's a whole lot. Uh, I think we're still working on like, what's, uh, you know, everybody needs strength and hypertrophy after an injury, but um, are there certain conditions that respond more uh, or respond better upper versus lower extremity? Um, You know, we need to know more about if we do a uh, blood flow restriction for the legs uh, will there be similar benefits in the upper extremity? So is there, is there a remote benefit or a mm-hmm. proximal benefit? We're still getting into the proximal benefits because we tend to think of just distal. I think we're learning more about systemic effects. So if you train one leg 
Um, does it help the other side or will it help upper body? As I mentioned, um, you know, the function piece, like I said, it's one thing to help with strength and hypertrophy and pain, but in our, in our business, we're all about performance. Does it change anything on the field? Does it get you on the field faster? You know, and I, so I think we're learning more about that. I think trained versus untrained uh, is another thing. Um, if you have a, an elite athlete, do they respond differently than somebody that is untrained uh, doing this in a, in a recovering situation? Uh, I think the exact mechanism is another thing. Like there's a, we have a pretty good handle, I think, on what we think is happening, but definitively, like so many other things in our field, uh, I'm not sure if we have a definitive uh, mechanism yet. Like I said, although we, we feel like we, we have a pretty good handle on that. I think ideal occlusion times, that it's always something up for debate. I mean, I get asked at meetings all the time, is it better to go lower uh, restriction pressure and work out longer or go mm-hmm. higher restriction pressure and work out shorter? You know, I get that asked a lot. So I think that we'll learn more about that down the road. And even like what position to do occlusion in. Um, there's, there's people that debate about that, you know, do it in standing, do it in supine. And currently I recommend you do legs and supine, um, and the upper body and sitting, but, you know, uh, I think we'll learn more about that down the road. Uh, so this really is, even though there's a whole lot of data on it, uh, a whole lot of papers, it seems like every month there's a new paper, uh, on BFR, some component of it. I still think there's a lot to learn. And one of the things that is And I know for me personally and talking with um, my students and other clinicians, safety concerns can be brought up a lot, right, as limiting factors. I don't know if I should try BFR with my patients because do we know that it's safe? How, How much do we know about how safe BFR is to use, especially in regard to blood clot development? Sure. Uh, that's a great question. It's one that comes up literally every time uh, I talk about this. Um, so uh, I'm going to start with the whole idea of safe things in ice. A car is not unsafe by itself, right. but if you're reckless behind the wheel, it's now unsafe. Right? So I don't think these devices, let's just be upfront to date. There is no concern whatsoever on the, in the literature that you're at a greater risk for blood clots or any adverse events. The adverse events that we have to date are very short-lived. So numbness, discomfort, maybe some patechiae on the skin, maybe a little soreness post-exercise, but it just has not shaken out that the risk of clots is any, uh, you're any more at risk to have a clot when using BFR or whatnot. And in fact, there might even be some protective aspects of clotting. You know, I think it's important for us to remember that, you know, surgical tourniquets are on at a higher pressure for a heck of a lot longer. And, and the risk of uh, clots from a couple studies is less than 1%. So uh, I really, it's probably an unfounded fear. I understand it. I get it because nobody wants that. Clots are a big deal. People can die from them, right? right. But, um, you know, like any other modality, whether it's a, uh, a treadmill or a elliptical or a BOSU, uh, anything else, there has to be some degree of responsibility in learning about the mechanisms, the best parameters, who's the best population, contraindications, precautions, things like that. So again, I, I hope um, that if you have reservations about that, uh, that you realize that they really are unfounded. I would point you to an article in uh, JOSPT by Bond et al. in 2019, a great review on plotting and things to the risk factors for that. There was also a review article by uh, Maniti et al. Uh, in, I think, JOSPT, where it was a meta-analysis, and it was mostly on knee disorders, they found, but the risk was really low there, too. So uh, if you are concerned about clots, I mean, you know, I know coming up in athletic training school and PT school, they talk about home and sign. You know, we know that right now it's not so great. I would, I would point you to the Wells criteria, uh, which has been published. You can certainly find that online. That's probably something that's a good um, filter for you to look through as far as risk of clotting. But as I said, um, I, I, right now, I, we, we have no evidence to indicate that clotting is a concern uh, using BFR. So in trained hands, it's no greater risk than any other modality. It's not. And, and, and the important point here is, is choosing your patients wisely. Yeah. You know, if we look at you know, the ones of the precautions or the contraindications. I mean, if you have somebody that's obese, diabetic, hypertensive, and not a great training history, this is the last thing you should be doing with them. 
you know, so we have to be smart. It's not a, it's not necessary. It's not perfect for everyone. So, uh, and it's not the modality of choice for everyone, just like any other modality we use. There are people that are appropriate and those that aren't. So again, as long as you inform yourself, uh, I think your, your, uh, risk of doing things are, or doing something at first are extraordinarily minimal. So what's your group's recommendations on how to select a BFR device? Yeah, that's a great question too. And you've got some good ones today. So um, I think the first thing we have to find out too, is just your state practice act. That's, that's the first thing, um, you know, the NATA and um, the APTA it's, it's in our practice act to do it, but certainly each individual state is different. The second thing is, I think, depending on the, situ- the environment you're in, you probably got to get the key stakeholders at the table. So you, you probably need to, you know, if, if you're a staff athletic trainer somewhere, you probably need the head athletic trainer, director of sports medicine, team physician, uh, potentially, um, you know, just student athlete, you know, compliance people, maybe even the ADs and stuff. I think everybody needs to be aware of it. Mm-hmm. Um, you start there. Um, so once we've uh, dotted those I's and crossed those T's, I think then we look at what's our budget. Because the, 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 you can certainly spend literally thousands and thousands of dollars on these units, but you can also spend $25 for weightlifting knee wraps, which is not the best way to go about it. But, you know, there are, there, this is a, um, it is, there is a huge yeah. spectrum and it's your, your risk tolerance. Uh, you know, there are certainly better ways to do this than others. Um, but I really think it comes down to, again, budget, comfort. Um, Again, risk tolerance is a little bit, and even when I say risk tolerance, my, my point there is that when you give somebody weightlifting knee wraps and you have them wrap their thighs, you are, it's a bit arbitrary. So I think you, you're at an elevated risk of getting yourself in trouble rather than a situation where you maybe use a Doppler or you actually measure their blood pressure and take a percentage there, which is a little more accurate. And then, of course, the most accurate is where they have the, the personalized pressures, so in a few systems often. So tell us more about this spectrum of application, right? You already mentioned things like utilizing Doppler, the personalized system. Tell us more about the differences between that. Okay. So um, early on with BFR in more healthcare settings, what we typically did was use a, if you, if you didn't have um, you know, the, the, the preeminent system, Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you typically would use a, maybe a blood pressure cuff or something like that. You would pump it up like you would a blood pressure. And typically you would take a percentage of the occluded pressure. So for example, um, there's been a couple papers where they would, uh, palpate the pedal pulse. They would, uh, inflate the cuff. And then when the, uh, pressure disappeared, you would take 60% of that, of occluded pressure. So there was at least a little more of a, uh, accurate or scientific approach to it. Now, there's certainly Dopplers that you could, um, which is, again, it's a really nice option um, to, you would put the Doppler over the, uh, over the um, pedal pulse, for example, and then pump it up again. And when it disappeared, take a percentage there. And then, of course, there are personalized systems where it, it gets your individual pressure, which is good because depending on what time of day you do BFR, you know, your pressure might be different if you do a morning or an afternoon session. And, and some days, even if you did the same afternoon session, you're different within yourself. So, I mean, that's why it's nice to have a, a personalized pressure if you have the opportunity to do that. What are some other treatment parameters for BFR? So, um, uh, typically, if you're in the upper body, it's with uh, 50% of the arterial occlusion pressure. Uh, the lower body is about um, 80%, but you can go from 40 to 80. You prefer the higher, at least that's what we indicate now. Mm-hmm. Um, we look at... Um, the load is about 20 to 40% of one RM. Now, some of you, some of you that haven't used it much, like, wait a minute, how can I get a one RM estimate in somebody that's four weeks out of an ACL? Fair question. So if you are doing that, there's a couple options. You could do two to three on an RPE scale. You could do a one RM on the other side. So let's say, for example, you do a, you're, you have a left knee ACL and you're eight, you know, 12 weeks out and you want to do seated knee extensions. Uh, you might do a one RM on the other side and take a percentage of that. Um, you could do a 10 RM, which isn't great. Uh, the further you get away from one, the, the one RM estimate gets not so good. Uh, mm-hmm. So there are some options there for that uh, or to figure out what the one RM would be. Um, the rest and, excuse me, the repetition and set schemes are, are again a bit all over the place. I mean, most studies that look at this 
you're between 75 and 90 reps. Uh, usually the first set is about 30, and then you have three sets of 15. But, you know, uh, the more we learn, it seems that a set or two to failure um, or to, you know, volitional failure is, is the way to go because, um, you know, you know, we got, the, we know we got the most out of it. Right. So, um, there's an element of to getting to that fatigue aspect, uh, which typically is also related to intensity that, you know, that if you really get to maximum failure, that all, all you know, all motor units are on deck, so to speak. So, uh, those are probably the main parameters I would say that most, uh, folks have to be concerned with if they're looking at the use of this modality. And then you're really personalizing it too, because it's that person's fatigue level. Sure. sure. And same thing with the pressures. Yeah. You know, as I mentioned, a lot of times when people are just getting going, again, you got to pick your patients and athletes wisely on this, right? So maybe some that you're not quite sure how they're going to handle it. You might start with a lower pressure to kind of condition them to it and then increase is tolerated. Mm -hmm. You get those athletes, you know, that would dive head first through a brick wall for you. You know, they're <laughs> probably going to be just fine starting with the higher pressures, but I've had I've had high school uh, females with an ACL have zero, probably 80%. And I've had big rough and tumble college wrestlers that say, this is making me sick. You got to take this thing off. So every it's across the spectrum. You know, it's, it's worth a shot if you get it, if you get a chance to do it. But there's certainly ways to kind of, um, like I said, condition people uh, to their tolerance to it. So we, we've talked a lot about post-operative, right? Resistance training. Are there any other ways that BFR can be used outside of that more traditional realm of resistance training? So uh, I'd say the main one, the main two really are the, um, well, there's a few, I, I, sorry, I'll go backwards. Uh, one is aerobic capacity. So mm -hmm. certainly uh, riding exercise bikes, walking. I mean, there's been some studies on the older population, but just walking with the cuffs on. Uh, improves aerobic capacity and even increases uh, hypertrophy and strength. So that's an option. Uh, also during periods of immobilization, there's a number of the early studies did that where um, they were basically uh, the people that were bedridden or uh, in, a, in a time of immobilization, it can certainly help uh, reduce atrophy. There's a number of studies supporting that. Uh, we have looked at as well, I mentioned the ischemic preconditioning. There are more athlete studies coming out on that. And admittedly, that was something I had to explore a little more. I didn't pay much attention to it because a lot of it was on people with cardiac disease and Parkinson's mm -hmm. and things like that. Well, it's not a population I treat very much, but now we started to see that this is a, I would encourage you athletic trainers, uh, especially, or those that are working in acute care settings to look at IPC, uh, which uh, what that is basically is that you're at full occlusion, you're resting, doing nothing, but full occlusion for five minutes, then you uh, reperfuse for five. And often the, the cycle is repeated, uh, you know, three or four times. Uh, for recovery. There's some decent studies showing. Yeah, there's some decent papers. Now there's a couple of course saying otherwise, but the ones that say otherwise are when they look at performance acutely. So the ones that have done well uh, in a recovery standpoint, uh, it's when they've needed to perform uh, 24 to 48 hours later. Mm -hmm. So for those of you that have a quick turnaround using the IPC, uh, you know, maybe in the legs, uh, if you've got a competition again in two days, this might be a good option to look at. Uh, maybe rather than uh, compression boots or cold chambers or things like that. So I would say the evidence for the IPC is probably a little better than those other ones that we might be using a lot of. That's interesting. I did not even know that that was an option. For... Yes. Yeah, it is. And admittedly, I, I had to do a little digging myself because I just didn't pay much attention, like I said, because it was in the cardiac uh, population largely. Uh, but there, there have been several studies in cyclists. There's been some in rugby, um, uh, but mostly more of the endurance sports uh, have, have looked at this. And, and just from talking to a lot of athletic trainers at the professional level, uh, they're using it for that too uh, mm -hmm. in those capacities. Now, what about injury type? We've talked about post-op. Is there, are you seeing differences in something like an overuse injury um, chronic injuries versus acute. See, again, that's, that's probably one of those ones I should have mentioned earlier that we're still learning about chronics and acutes and tendinopathies is a big one. Uh -huh. You know, actually for this article, it, it was really hard to write an article on this topic with 50 <laughs> references and 5,000 words. Like this was really hard. Like there was so much of this that we cut out and a lot of it was diagnosis specific stuff. So back to your question, there is some good literature on bone healing. So in your athletes with stress fractures, potentially, uh, you know, our athletes that 
any kind of bone fractures, you know, uh, BFR is a good option. Uh, pain, it's a nice option for, for pain because you're training in lower load. So if you have maybe a population where you're dealing with, let's just say a very active middle-aged male or female with, you know, knee arthritis that loves to do sprint triathlons, but weight training just really hurts. Like this is a, a, a good option because you're in, in lower, um, uh, uh, lower load situations. Uh, also, like I said, any post-op, it, it's good for um, tendinopathies. Like I said, I think it's not my first choice. And so I said, I, I say this in, in the course that I have online. I, I mentioned this to anybody that asks, this is where your clinical reasoning and decision-making has to come in. You know, if we look at tendons, they love load and tension. Well, yeah. we've taken the load out and we've taken kind of the tension out too when we, when we do BFR. Now, if they can't tolerate loads and, you know, you, you feel like you can do some good work with lower loads, it's probably a decent option. There's been uh, one study that I'm aware of in the Achilles uh, where there was some cross-sectional area increases after using BFR, um, but it's not my first choice for tendinopathy. It's just not. Uh, I think we just have other choices that are an option now. It may shake out differently a few years down the road, um, but as of now, I, I can't say it's my first choice. So uh, as I said, uh, aerobic capacity, pain, uh, bone healing, uh, and of course, the any anybody that needs strength and hypertrophy, which is just about any patient or athlete that we see. So, what are your recommendations uh, for clinicians that might have patients coming to them saying, "You know, I've heard about this BFR training. I think that I want to do it. What What do you recommend?" for clinicians to consult great, those patients? Great question. Cause people do the searching and they watch yes. stuff on TV and they're like, I got to do that. I can be that person. Right. Just like it's the same they thing see like it on when, Instagram, right? <laughs> when, when some pro athlete, you know, uh, is back in the field, like in five months after an ACL, like they think they can do that too. Right. So yeah. yeah, why not me? So I think the first question I would ask in those situations is, okay, well, how come do you feel like the training you're doing currently isn't doing the trick? You know, because a lot of times, and I wrote an editorial piece on this, it was an opinion piece, but, you know, one of the things that I have a problem or one of the things I question, I want to make sure everybody is questioning themselves when they look at using this modality is, is what is normal training not doing the trick? It's supposed to be, and I can't emphasize this enough, BFR is supposed to be an augment or a supplement to what you're already doing. We don't want to throw out years and years and years of traditional training that works to use the sexy new toy. Uh, so I would ask the client first, you know, why do you want to do this? Uh, well, I just want to try it out. It looks kind of cool. Okay. Well, that's, that's certainly, um, reasonable. Like, what are your goals? Like, are you trying to, like, do you hurt? Cause yeah. if you can tolerate higher loads, I would do it. Right. So I would ask that question. Um, if they just like, no, I just want to give it a shot. It looks cool. And you know, I hear people talk, it gives you a major pump, you know, so let's try it. Well, then that, that, that's reasonable to try it. My suggestion would be is that you, you, they need to, you need to educate them on like actually, okay, are they going to buy their own system and what's their budget? Because if they're not going to buy their own system and they're going to use weightlifting knee wraps, well, they need to know what that pressure feels like. Mm -hmm. They need to know what it shouldn't feel like as well. So I would visit with them about that, do it with them a few times in the, in the clinic or your training room with them. So they know what it feels like, uh, under, make sure they understand the rep and set schemes, uh, make sure they understand, because if you tell people. They're like, oh man, that was the best workout ever. Now they're doing it twice a day and they end up with an effort thrombosis in the upper body, right? There are case studies on that, you know? So I think most of the time it's making sure people understand that this is something you do it maybe a few times a week. You can increase your pressure. You start with, I would start with lower pressures and then increase as they tolerate it. Uh, and then you show they don't have any adverse response to it. Uh, and then once they're comfortable, I think, hey, it's worth giving a shot, but just emphasize that uh, even though it's cool, it, it's still, it's still good to push weight. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. What are your recommendations for clinicians that want to dip their toe into the waters of BFR? Well, like anything else, any other modality you're going to use, whether it's a laser or whether it's uh, uh, compression boots or whatever, you got to be informed. So uh, first step is always check out the literature. Uh, there are a number of courses online that you could do for this. Uh, Talk to people that are that are using it. Uh, understand, like anything else, contraindications, precautions, the indications. Um, you know, with this specifically, you know, I get asked a lot about uh, when to start it. Like, is it day one post-op? There are people that will start at day one post-op. Uh, 
I personally, it's my personal opinion on this. Uh, I always say, where's the fire? Mm-hmm. Like, is the Super Bowl tomorrow? Because <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, th- there are several papers that start at two weeks. I think in the first couple of weeks, people are in pain, they're uncomfortable. There are so many other things I can do in those first two weeks to, to help people uh, get better and, and achieve their goals. Plus, we let, we let incisions close. Usually the first two weeks are when most people are most skittish about clots. So that's why I say, let's wait a little bit. Um, but can I point you to a paper that says, I, you, know, you shouldn't start immediately? No, I can't do that either. Uh, but again, this is where clinical decision-making comes in, kind of like an anopathy piece. So uh, does, that, does that answer your question? I know I got off a little bit of a tangent there. Uh, I, oh, sometimes that happens. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think it does. I mean, I guess I feel like with with all of these things, I mean, I, I was not taught BFR in my training, right? This is continuing education things that you need to look into and see. And I think that's that's a lot of the times the hesitation of how do I find good resources and something that I can feel comfortable and safe after I've taken some training. Yeah. I mean, there is a ton of literature on this. Uh, it's, it's hard to open a journal anymore without something being on BFR. Uh, there's a number of journals that have, like I know Frontiers of Physiology actually has an entire downloadable free BFR ebook uh, that's got a lot of articles that they've specifically published. Um, but yeah, literature is always the first place to go. Uh, there's no question about that. And I said, certainly talking to folks that are using it. Um, you know, I think the danger, depending on what environment you're in, you know, like for example, the guy that got this started back in the 1960s, Yoshiaki Sato is his name. He started Katsu training. You know, he really started with using a belt and cinching his leg. And that's just, again, that's what kind of, we tend to put that group now in the kind of the, the, the meatheads or the gym bros in the corner of the gym, just, you know, cinching their arms off. Like, we don't, we don't want to do that. And, and hopefully as athletic trainers and as PTs and other healthcare professionals that might be listening to this, we know that there are options out there. We can get a little more precise mm-hmm. with the pressures that we use. And of course, I would encourage you to do that. And well, the nice thing is, like I said, is there are a number of, of, of options that are, there are a few hundred bucks and that won't break your bank account. So this is an option, even if you're a, at a small community college in a rural state somewhere or a rural community somewhere in, in, in a state in the country, or even if you have the deep pockets, there's lots of options. And I know we got into a lot of really in-depth stuff today on this talk, but you guys did a wonderful job on summarizing in this clinical concepts article, the different things that are known and giving some treatment parameters. So I'd recommend anybody listening that's interested in the treatment parameters to, to get this manuscript and to look into it some more. Um, so. My last question for you is what, what trends do you see down the future that you're really excited about and wanting to learn more, whether it's in the BFR realm or outside of it, what are some things that look promising that you're excited about? Uh, let me make sure I understand your question. Are you, you said not BFR related. So anything it could sports be, medicine? Okay. It could be okay. um, in blood flow restriction or could be anything in sports medicine. What gets you excited right now? Uh, with BFR, I think the uh, more literature we see, the better. And, and some of the stuff that we, we we don't know yet. So more on more literature on that. Uh, I, I, I would love to see more on the ischemic preconditioning mm-hmm. for a recovery modality. Uh, there are some promising papers on that. I think the more of that we see, the better because the, the science behind the mechanism of BFR is, even though we don't know the exact, is still pretty good. And we got a, decades of it to show it. You know, our field, athletic trainers know this better than anybody. People come in and they want the shiny new toy and there's no literature or science to back it up. Uh, but, hey, I'm a firm believer in if you think it works, it did. Now, I know some people get outraged when you say that, but... Sometimes as athletic trainers and PTs, we've got to give our athletes way, right? And if they believe that something works, it did. Well, this is one that we actually have some decent data that if you maybe are a little uncomfortable doing some of the wacky things that athletes ask for, <laughs> this one, I don't think you should feel that bad about because we have some, some good literature and athletes for recovery. So it's, it's worth a shot. Now, certainly there is some, I think there's some debate, particularly in the upper extremity. Like, you know, I know for me personally, 
I, you know, I don't know about how do we feel about compressing the neurovascular structures and throwers when we already know that they have, you know, uh, thoracic outlet issues, not all of them, but certainly that's a concern. So something I tend to think about when I, who I have in front of me. Um, as far as sports medicine in general, I really think it's exciting. Uh, some of the things we're doing as far as like GPS and workload monitoring. Uh, certainly there's debates about what the best way is to do that, but you know, so many of our return to sport protocols are very general, like X amount of throws uh, in this phase or, you know, run this far, those kind of things. Well, if we can dial down to, you know, how far does the average, uh, you know, midfielder, you know, in soccer run in a match, how far does a wide receiver versus an offensive lineman, how many, like how much ground do they actually cover in a game? At what intensity are they doing that? We can really pinpoint our return to sport progressions rather than be, um, admittedly, it's kind of an art at that point. Um, I think that's exciting. I think uh, we'll find out more about, um, it seems to be there's a lot of stuff on genetic research, on linking stuff to, to injury uh, and, and recovery. But I do think, uh, in my view, a lot of the getting better with the metrics as far as workload, when they test mm-hmm. people's blood lactate and you know, this is somebody that really worked hard in the game. We need to back them off. Or this is somebody that didn't work too hard. We can really push them in this practice, or maybe they, we can expect more out of them in the next game is, is, I think, some areas that are exciting. Thank you so much, Dan, for joining me today. I greatly appreciate it. And uh, like I mentioned already, this current clinical concepts article is available free of charge from the Journal of Athletic Training um, online, and they actually have some really good wearable and GPS technology articles out there too right now. So I highly recommend everybody to go download um, your, your current manuscript that's currently out in this September issue. Thank you again, Dan. Thank you. And uh, real quick, I have to say a a shout out and a thank you to my co-authors. I could not have done this article without them. Um, They did a ton of work on this and it would be a shame if I didn't say uh, to thank you to them because it was definitely a group effort. So thanks to those uh, uh, folks that were on it.